So greetings again. Uh, I would like to uh, welcome everybody back uh, to our fourth session. And I will just go ahead and jump right in and share my screen and begin our, our presentation for today. I really appreciate any of the comments and questions. Uh, feel free to continue those. And I'll try to answer those uh, as I can as a reminder. It's kind of difficult for me to see the chat when I'm in the presentation mode. So I may get to those uh, a little bit later or when we pause. Uh, and I may actually get to them when we, uh, between sessions. But don't hesitate at all uh, to ask questions either verbally or on the virtual hand raising, whatever works best for you. Uh, so I would like to share today's session, which is going to be on this concept of uh, follow-up from last week's project-based learning. I did get uh, quite a few positive feedbacks and, and that, that was helpful. Uh, I think a lot of people know about project-based learning and problem-based learning. Uh, reminded us of the derivative of that being inquiry-based. And so the whole point is really coming up with these uh, very clear structures and, and lines of questioning so that our students could be guided along uh, the, process, the process of this conceptual understanding. Uh, today, I'm going to follow up with a session on, so let's say that we do develop a great project-based learning and our students love it and things are happening. Well, how do we figure out uh, what they've learned? How do we figure out really some of the outcomes, uh, the level of success, how they're able to perform? And like with many times that we do um, with what we call relatively abstract or maybe some subjective learning aspects, we have to develop some ways to, to capture that um, process and learning in a, in a consistent, systematic way. And so I'm going to kind of review a little bit of, uh, of a session that I did um, in the spring quarter, spring semester, on the concept of assessment, measurement, and evaluation. Oftentimes we jump to one of these and there is a process that we have to use. But I'm going to spend most of the time really focusing in on how we can use these concepts um, to take our great project-based structure and make sure that we are uh, providing students clear directions and clear methods so that they can so they know what success looks like and they can actually um, target what they do to be successful in these. So um, like any good um, uh, session, I want to make sure that we have our, our um, learning outcomes clearly defined. So hopefully in the next 50 minutes or so, Afterwards, you'll be able to uh, discriminate uh, between the concepts of assessment, measurement, and evaluation. And I really hope you start to think about the, the amount of energy and the amount of uh, time that you and your students are devoting to these. They really should be kind of inversely uh, correlated. You should be spending a, a, a tremendous amount of time on assessment, uh, some time on measurement, and a very little amount of time on evaluation. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. I'd like you to be able to propose some ways uh, to effectively use these rubrics, uh, these analytical, potentially holistic uh, rubrics uh, to uh, collect data and measure for uh, student abstract work, such as in a project base. Uh, keeping in mind that you can use these kind of rubrics also in the other uh, categories that we talked about last week, be it uh, collaborative, cooperative, problem-based, experiential, service-based. These are all part of that umbrella of inquiry-based learning. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to get a little bit maybe intense, maybe a little bit complex, a little bit um, mathematical in, in sharing with you, how do you know when your rubric is actually good, when it's, when it's rigorous, when it's actually working in a way that uh, you intended it to be? I think most of you are, are graduate students or have graduated from a graduate program. Um, so I, I don't think that the, the complexities that I'm going to share with you are going to be above uh, what, what you're able to do and have done. I do want to remind folks that uh, the, you know, the rubrics and, and project-based learning is not the beginning and end. It actually is in the middle of a very normal course design process. So hopefully if you're looking to use some of this, you've already given a lot of thought on uh, step one, which is these uh, desired results. We typically call these learning outcomes. And uh, you've got those all kind of developed. And you're ready to find ways to, uh, to collect some evidence to determine whether students are, are actually um, addressing these outcomes. And then we can actually talk about some of the methods uh, a little bit later. But the rubrics are going to clearly be in this middle section of how we might uh, develop an instrument, have to develop some way to, to consistently collect data uh, for students, for ourselves, for everybody, so that they can understand and be able to move along this pathway in a very productive, clear way. 
uh, for the folks that, uh, again, I'm trying to walk this line of share information that can be used face to face uh, in a hybrid format in a completely online format. Uh, I think some of us, we're not sure what exactly is going to happen. Uh, I know in most parts of the world, um, for the next uh, semester, I think China probably is going to do mostly face to face, but it doesn't hurt to, to really develop um, these kind of rubrics uh, so that you're ready in case something happens like it did happen uh, last spring and be able to offer up your, your learning experiences in multiple modes. So this is a slide that I did uh, share uh, several months ago. So uh, maybe some of you didn't join the, the spring sessions, even the ones, the ones that were there for the spring session. I, I, I don't know if you really have got, uh, you know, this was pretty deep and dense uh, definitions of these three terms. I use this acronym AIM, A-M-E, which, uh, as I mentioned in the learning outcomes, does stand for the assessment, measurement, and evaluation. And so I'm going to go through these again very clearly because uh, until we understand these and we can really use them as a normal part of our vocabulary, a normal part of our course design, I think we're going to struggle with um, really trying to, to get to be to, at the point of being effective teachers uh, all around. So assess, assessment, this is what a lot of times people use this term interchangeably as meaning a test or an exam. Uh, and I'm here to say that it's, it can be, um, but assessment is literally, in, in its simplest format, it's gathering behavioral data. I always remind people that, um, you know, I'm gathering data right now. Uh, you're probably gathering data on, on myself, how I'm speaking, how I'm presenting this, uh, my intonations, my inflections. Um, you're probably gathering data on whether you're hungry. Maybe it's late at night for you, so maybe you're a little bit uh, tired. So these are all things that we naturally gather data on. The difference between that kind of data gathering and what we might do with students is that we try to be a little more intentional. And so we formalize this. And th that formalization usually occurs in having some sort of an instrument that allows us to gather that. I know that uh, you as teachers, you probably can gather a lot of data from students just by looking at their behavior maybe looking at a trend of, of how they behaved in the past or how they performed in the past. And all these are, are great data points, but to really do our best, we have to find a way to systematically uh, collect this data. And that's where the second one comes into play, which is measurement. Uh, the measurements are basically this, this measure, this, this, this set of marks, attributes, uh, criteria, something that allows us to actually uh, be very, very clear, and I always encourage to be upfront uh, with our students ahead of time so that they know precisely what it is that success looks like. A lot of times we think about this is, um, you know, students are, they're, they're novice learners. They're not really sure. For me as a chemist, I'm trying to help them understand what a chemist looks like and, and does and, and behaves and, and how they think and how they process. These are all pretty, uh, pretty complex behaviors that we exhibit because we've been doing this for so long but to try to really outline for them um, what that might be is, is gonna be a challenge, uh, and, and we need to be doing this in small ways the entire time that we work with them. One of the big drawbacks, sometimes people talk about these rubrics, is that uh, some teachers think that it really, that, that it pins them in or it puts them in some sort of a, a situation where they're, uh, they don't have as much freedom uh, to make uh, decisions because they're experts and they wanna be able to do that. I'm going to encourage you not to think in that way. Rubrics are simply a tool. Um, uh, they're a device that's going to allow you to be uh, a little more consistent. Um, but uh, you can build them so that you can build in a lot of these um, abilities to, to be free to, to express things and to uh, provide uh, guidance uh, for student um, work as you go along. So these are just going to be the, um, the, the, the criteria that you know is, is successful. That's the second step. Uh, as I mentioned, you want to do a lot of data gathering. You want to basically have your uh, assessments, uh, measurements built ahead of time. I strongly encourage that you share that with students ahead of time. There should be no surprises. They should have all this information so they can then uh, be as prepared as possible. And then the very last thing is the evaluation. And to make the best judgment, to make the best evaluation, we really need to have a lot of assessment data and we need to know what it is that we were looking for. So we need to have those measurements clearly in place. And only with those two uh, really built and having done those well, can we then make uh, some sort of a consistent judgment on whether students have met those marks or not. And so if we've done this well, um, 
then it really, we, sh we should be doing a small amount of high stakes uh, final judgment evaluations on student performance. Obviously, we should be doing a lot of formative assessments, a lot of feedback, a lot of back and forth so that ultimately when um, it comes to the end, and it could be the end of a week or a month or a semester, uh, then there should be no surprises. Students shouldn't be thinking, oh, wow, I really thought I knew that, or wow, I got an A, I thought I was you know, doing poorly. Uh, so, so that's kind of on us as instructors to make sure that that's really laid out clearly for them. So I'll be using these terms throughout. Um, I always like to start with these so that people uh, know that these are my definitions and you can see these are, these are cited by researchers. And so this is pretty common in, in educational uh, research. I do wanna start off with, since we mentioned assessment and we're gonna get to the measurement portion, but we always need a bit of a background in this, is that what is uh, some of the good practices for assessment? Obviously, it begins with these educational values, and I'll, I'll hopefully I'll be repetitive because we talked about the course design, the, the three steps of the backward design, the, the learning outcomes. We need to have those really solid before we even uh, work with the, the uh, measurements. So if you're thinking about creating a project base, if you're thinking about creating a rubric, I'll challenge you to first of all, make sure that your learning outcomes are very clear and measurable, and they actually contain some sort of a, an aspect of a project base so that you can align and lean into that uh, when you get to that. Um, there should be all kinds of dimensions. There should be what I call sticky. Now, they should allow um, students to integrate these into their other disciplines. And, and most of all, they're gonna basically, assessment's gonna be revealed in how they perform or they're able to do some things. You may recall we talked about learning outcomes in three forms, uh, knowledge, skills, and disposition. And so good assessment typically kind of relies on the skills uh, type level. I really like this one because uh, I, I share with a lot of folks, people use terms like teaching and learning and assessment. I don't know about you, but I can't do those in isolation. Uh, when I think about teaching, uh, learning and assessment is embedded inside of that. And I, I think about this as it's ongoing. I'm constantly kind of talking, sharing, getting feedback, it's, it, it's back and forth. And so this isn't something that you may say, okay, let me pause right now and, and do some assessment, or let me pause and do um, um, assessing or measuring some project base. It, it really should be integrated uh, with many of the things that you do. Um, it's gonna begin with the concepts, with the outcomes of the concepts. And this is the first time that I'll mention this concept of a driving question. And you'll see that that's gonna be key as we talked about last week with um, uh, project-based learning typically starts with a driving question. Some people call it an essential question, large question, big questions, whatever you like to use for those terminologies. But that driving question is not only gonna drive the projects, uh, but it's gonna really be a major driver of your rubrics. Obviously, it's a part of a larger set, this, this conceptual framework. I have to remind uh, teachers sometimes that uh, I think about the, the conceptual frameworks like a large jigsaw puzzle. Students are unaware of what that puzzle looks like. Sometimes they see the pieces of the puzzle as just isolated facts, but in actuality, it's part of a larger framework that we should be really thinking about and being intentional about uh, when we design some of these. And the bottom line is that uh, one of the most powerful parts of the um, of PBL is that it is and should be authentic. Uh, this is, is a positive aspect. It can also be seen as a drawback because sometimes authenticity opens um, us up to more abstract subjective work and interpreting students' uh, behaviors, and that's where rubrics can really help us be more consistent on measuring that. So uh, I, I do wanna also share some fairly recent research because a lot of times um, teachers will wanna know, uh, is this something that uh, we'll have to sell to students? Does it have to, we have to defend to students? Uh, and not that we always kind of uh, do exactly what students uh, want to or like or prefer, uh, but this uh, data I thought really allowed us uh, to move ahead with some project-based without having uh, to spend time on trying to defend this, this approach. But uh, they did a pretty large poll and they found that uh, today, 2020, 2017, 2018, uh, students actually um, don't really prefer quizzes and traditional papers. And I kind of put group work in, in light there because I think that that's uh, a structural issue, not the fact that they, um, they don't like group work. Um, I think I mentioned last time that uh, if they didn't like group work when they left our classes, they would all sit in the lunchroom by themselves, but they don't. They find ways to get together. They like to socialize. And I think that those aspects need to be integrated inside the project base. Uh, they're okay with some audio recordings and some open discussions, uh, but the things that they really like 
are you know responses to videos and I'll say Twitter summaries. It could be any type of a social network or any type of a uh, of, a, of a really um, uh, networked kind of conversation that they summarize. Screencasts, uh, which I mentioned a while ago, for both um, this is kind of a screencast. If, if the video outcome of this would be uh, showing what's on my screen and, and my voice, uh, this is great for, for for teachers to do. But I also recommend that a screencast could be part of a project-based learning, part of a rubric that you ask students to create a screencast. At the end, I'll show you a kind of a unique way that I have my students create a presentation using a screencast-like uh, approach. Uh, obviously, field experiences builds into authentic experiences. Those need to be structured. You need to help students model those, um, you know, share with them exactly the kind of uh, uh, data that you'd like them to collect. And again, at the end of this uh, session, I'll share with you my rubric that I use, uh, that maybe portions of those uh, could be used when you do these things. Interviews, work samples. So, these are some ideas that you may be already thinking about building into your, your project-based learning. These are ideas that would be great to add to your rubric, um, but I will mention, and probably a big reason why people were requesting this, this, this topic, is that these can become um, vague and they can become a bit subjective. And so building a rubric that allows us to consistently measure these uh, is gonna be really essential. So people might start to be thinking also like, what are other things? Uh, we mentioned project-based learning, and I want to share a few other if you're thinking about both how, uh, how you might collect some assessment data, but also how you might integrate inside your project. Uh, many times the best projects are, as we mentioned, kind of multi-layered, uh, so it isn't just one way that, that we're working with them on a project. Those projects could include multiple artifacts. Uh, you could have them do a, a miniature research paper embedded. You could have them perform something, uh, you know, halfway through for myself when I do this uh, with my students teaching environmental chemistry, I have them actually perform um, a, a, a meeting with a client and they have to sit down with mock clients and they're basically uh, pitching a, a remediation uh, device and a remediation procedure. Uh, they're sharing with them what the contaminants they found in monitoring wells, where's the gradient, where's the flow, why they project wells there, what the costs are going to be. So that's a performance. And, and I think that those performances can be really embedded inside of these, these projects. And to do it well, you need to make sure that those uh, performances are included in those rubrics uh, that you're going to build. And I'll share with you my examples of those rubrics. And I'll tell you right now that not that mine's perfect, but it will be an example that you may be able to modify. Also, uh, really thinking about maybe using some technology, uh, having them do some blogs. And, and, and keep in mind, a blog, uh, for those that, that may not be familiar with this, uh, the word blog is a simple derivative from uh, years ago, people started to write a um, kind of a documentation of a procedure or what they were doing in the classroom. And so those were called diaries. Uh, some people call them logs, uh, it, you know, documented, and they were on the web. And so people call them web logs. And then they just kept on saying that and it became web logs. And then it just turned into blogs. And so that's all a blog is, is, is this, um, kind of clear documentation of, of what's going on day to day, week to week. Uh, these make great for uh, PBL rubrics because I wanna know how, uh, what my students are talking about. I wanna know how they're documenting. I wanna know how they're actually processing information. Uh, and a blog doesn't have to be online. It can simply be something within a, a Google doc or something within a Word document, any kind of way that they can track this and share it uh, internally with you or with, with the other uh, members and a podcast or a vodcast uh, that comes from the broadcasting industry. So this is uh, something that they're actually creating and they're, um, they're sharing it in a way uh, with their, their team members or with, um, with you. Uh, the, the, the big key with a broadcast or a podcast, some people make a, a, an audio file and say, oh, that's a, a podcast. No, that's an audio file. A podcast, uh, what makes it a podcast is some sort of um, a serialness to it. So there's some sort of a, a storyline. There's, there's multiple episodes, uh, which I think really fall in line well with the project base because you want them week one to have some thoughts and then you want them to be kind of moving on to the next thoughts and next thoughts and building a case, a, a storyline. We talked about experiential and service. Uh, there's some other things here that uh, you can think about building in. So these are all ideas that are really good and right for rubrics. I also think that you may be think you should probably think about making uh, portions of these part of your rubric uh, with the PBL. Again, I'll share my example that, that uses quite a bit of these um, to think about it holistically. Uh, I do see a lot of um, 
chats going on. I, I can't quite see those. I'll get to those in just a minute. Hopefully they're, uh, they're maybe you're talking and sharing some information with each other, which is great, great. So uh, just make sure the, uh, now we're shifting to, uh, to uh, the rubric aspect of this. And I wanna, as I normally do, really kind of operationally define what this rubric is. I can't imagine that uh, most of you know what one is. You probably use one, built one, uh, and uh, which is great, which is great. Uh, these are common in K through 12 around the world, higher ed, not so much, um, but they're, they're basically a bridge. They're this communication device. They're a translator uh, between your outcomes and your assessment. Uh, they help uh, create this language so that you can speak to your students in a very common way. And, and I use it a lot for that uh, so that we don't have to wonder like what does success like and look like and what does that mean and well I did this is this okay uh, and so I have a conversation well is it okay let's look at the rubric and let's see what the rubric says uh, and and I almost really try to teach them how to answer that themselves this is a part of that self-regulated learning that we talked about earlier um, they need to be able to look at a document and say no that's not that's I, what I have prepared really doesn't fit that and and if I were the teacher, I wouldn't give myself full points for that because I'm not really, so I need to modify that before I turn this in. And so rubrics aren't just at the end of, of a project or at the end of an assessment. I really try to encourage students to use it as a daily or a weekly guide. It, it can really help them guide. And of course they can ask some questions. And what I do most of the time is if they do ask a question about a rubric item, um, I'll modify that item. Literally, that's why everything I have is online. I'll update the item um, so that people can actually see I see a lot of, um, I'm gonna just pause here for a second um, and go out. Let me, just, let me check the chat real quick in case there's, um, okay, good. I just wanna make sure, good, good, good. Because sometimes there's some great questions in the chats and I wanna make sure that uh, if we need to go a tangent, then I'm happy to do that. Great, love it. Thank you all so much for, um, uh, great, contributing to the chat. Thank you. That's um. Continue to do that. Don't don't let me don't let me stop that. Um. Uh, but but a rubric should really define this criteria. And uh, I don't know about you, but the first time I write a rubric, it's usually not very good. Um. I, I share it with peers. We we review it. We beat it up. We change it because these words can be really interpreted differently. I usually get a, a small group of students, and I beta test it on them, and I you know try to get their feedback. Uh, and then even the first time I, I, I use a rubric on a particular assignment, I'll give one extra point uh, for any student that will basically give me some feedback on the rubric, uh, because I wanna really make this rubric as good as possible. And then through time, it takes just a couple iterations, it usually becomes a, a pretty solid uh, rubric that, that you can use and you can rely on. And I'll share with you a few calculations that you can do to make sure that that's working. Um, I don't want to. Uh, I want to make sure that we remember our, our, our you know, Bloom's taxonomy, and, and when we talk about how we might develop some of these, along with our outcomes and our assessments, uh, these really come in handy when it uh, starts to think about how we might develop a hierarchy for our uh, rubric. We should remember things like, you know, Bloom's the lower levels of knowledge and comprehension. Those are okay, but you'll see that I, I'm not. I don't rely on those. Um, I really try to focus in on some of these other ones, which will be some of the mid to higher levels like application and analysis, mainly because when you're doing the projects and you're working with rubrics, you really need to think about being efficient. And uh, sure, you could walk through every single one with knowledge and comprehension, but you're gonna find that you end up developing a really, really long rubric. Uh, when if you can kind of build some of these in, and obviously I'll be transparent that, that my favorite is, is kind of at the synthetic level because I can be super efficient uh, and really kind of embed a lot of the previous levels into that uh, level uh, so that I know that they actually can do some of these things at that level of synthesizing. So, so that might be when, when you find your rubric is starting to get really long and cumbersome, uh, you may step back and think, okay, maybe I need to do more synthetic levels and combining some things in, in a way that makes some, some sense. So uh, about halfway through, and I thought this, this is I'm at a good point because I want to kind of dig deeper into some of these, but uh, if you haven't seen some rubrics, I'd like to show you some examples of some rubrics and point out what I see some of the key features that we may want to attend to. Uh, so this is a fairly uh, straightforward one. It happens to be from a pretty well-known uh, entity in the U.S. of the AACNU, American Association of um, Colleges and Universities, and this is the, what they call their the written communication. They've got a dozen of these 
uh, from critical thinking to writing to presenting to the kind of the normal things. Uh, but I wanted to highlight uh, some of the things here. Obviously, the attributes are going to be really key. Uh, so the, the items that are on the, the left-hand side, the, the y-axis, um, this is going to be important that you come up with these really key aspects, right? So this is the content and the development and the genre and the sources. Um, but also, you have a lot of flexibility. And this is where I want to try to, to share with folks who, who think that rubrics might kind of uh, limit them from, from really doing a, a, an assessment and an evaluation is you can make this uh, words, you can make it letters, you can make it numbers, uh, you can even do an acceptable, non-acceptable. Uh, you can have two different uh, formats of rubrics that basically is uh, one in the formation of, and so it can be guiding drafts and really be, okay, you're, you're halfway through the semester and it can literally say you're on track, you're not on track. But it seems to be the biggest struggle is that um, uh, many people really struggle with the, the information that's inside and making sure that those are appropriately gradiated. And so somebody knows the difference between uh, a four and a three or successful or emerging or developed, that's probably gonna be one of your biggest challenges, not only coming up with that, uh, that verbiage, that narrative, that text, but really making sure that students know the difference between those uh, because otherwise you start to have this debate and the students say, well, I thought um, that I really was clearly in the, you know, the excellent region so, so that's where you have to be as detailed as possible, maybe quantitative. I'll share a few examples of those uh, so that they know exactly what it is that's expected of them. Uh, really popular is critical thinking rubrics. Uh, again, this is kind of similar. Uh, I, I circle proficiency because you may want to literally have, uh, you know, three, um, you know, levels of uh, proficient, above proficiency, below, uh, meets expectation, does not meet expectations. Uh, you know, this is really going to come down to what the project is, the way that you're approaching this, but, but really make sure that you're breathing your life, your, uh, your approach, your philosophy into these and not just think that you have to do ABC, uh, one, two, three, four, five, five points. It can be really almost anything um, that, uh, that you need it to be. Here's a, a specific one for uh, <coughs> project-based learning. Um, I kind of like this because as you see it, it, it basically uh, talks about uh, inquiry and driving questions and 21st century skills, all of these things are going to be really things that uh, you probably are going to build into your PBL. Uh, but I also like this because it doesn't talk about grades or A's or B's. This I would, I would see as a more formative, uh, a draft that you could provide to students and say, okay, so you've done this work, um, but when I look at this, I'm going to measure and evaluate it as it's kind of lacking some of the features, or it's okay, but it needs a little more development or it really is, is hitting upon some of the ideas that, um, uh, that I was hoping and, and I shared with you that I like to see in these. I think that the best way these are done as well is that you, you really have to model these. You can't just hand these out. Um, the way that I have found uh, these work most effectively is that if I take either made up examples or past examples with student permissions and, and made anonymous, and at the very beginning, I'll share uh, uh, basically a project that, that is at, the, at this lower end, and I'll share one that's at the higher end. So they can start to see uh, really clearly uh, more of a concrete way of the kind of behaviors and products that I'm looking for that, that really align with these. Uh, so models are gonna be extremely uh, valuable uh, for students. I know it takes time up front, but I find it really uh, reduces a lot of the confusing questions uh, later on, which takes a lot of time uh, at times when we may not have. All right, I'm gonna double check the chat again. I love it. We seem to be um, chatting. Great, great, great. I'm just reading the chat. Um, excellent. Padlet, yep, there's, and, and the people that are using Padlet, um, they are starting to charge money for, for that, for some of the accounts. I still use it a lot. There's some other free ones like Wakelet, but my new favorite one is the Google Jamboard, which is a really similar approach to, um, uh, oh, the, 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 that would require a VPN. So that's, um, good, 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 love it. Okay, so um, yeah, keep, keep, the, keep the chat up, love it. Um, I am gonna share with you uh, my example, and I'm always a bit hesitant to do this because there's nothing perfect about my example. Maybe I've, it's a little more focused in on the research and I've done a little bit more. So please don't see this as the perfect example, but maybe there's some aspects of it that, that you can see. 
Uh, I'll share a link to the, the whole aspect uh, of what I do with, with my students and all the descriptions and so forth on our shared Google Doc if you want to look at those. Uh, but I'm going to walk through, uh, when I do a project base, some of the, the major things that I do. I'll basically have a pretty intensive rubric and I'll ask my students uh, for their driving question uh, to connect, not to collect, not to just state, but connect. That's key for me is I want them to basically take and connect 10 multimedias. So they have to go out and find uh, simulations, uh, um, artificial intelligence, uh, IOTs, uh, videos, whatever it may be. They have to find those and they have to connect them to their, uh, their driving question. Of course, books, uh, they have to kind of find internet sites. I make it very clear what's allowable. Uh, we can't, I, I don't allow them to, to share .coms, even .orgs. Uh, they must be either .govs, .edu, something that's actually credible and has some sort of citations to those. This is one of my biggest problems is that a lot of times our students don't know the difference between these sites and don't realize that even if you have a .org, which stands for organization, um, you can purchase a .org. Anybody can purchase a .org. Um, and so thinking about how we might really understand what these internet sites might be. And then we get down to, uh, they have to actually look up peer-reviewed science articles. Uh, think about what's important in your genre, what are the qualifications, what makes it uh, the kind of article. And for me, this is, we all know this is kind of the, uh, the coin of the realm, they have to be peer-reviewed. And then also because I'm trying to help them understand how to be a chemist. Uh, being a chemist requires a bit of like understanding clients and business. And so they have to go out and look at some business articles and how those business articles in the environmental chemistry field, how they're selling those, how they're actually making sense of those, how they're connecting with the clients. Um, we have to talk in our, in our realm, and I think in education as well, but in chemistry, we have to talk about the international, regional, local standards. Uh, standards could be for uh, you know, minimum contamination levels for water, wastewater, those types of things. So they have to connect that to their driving question. We focus on an, all the science process skills, uh, and so they have to connect. How are they observing, interpreting, predicting, discussing, sharing? They have to connect those uh, to their driving question. We get really big into social ramifications. As you might imagine, the environmental chemistry is, is large in this, right? So when you have low uh, quality water standards or air quality, how is that gonna affect society? How are we gonna find uh, and have uh, conversations about how we're gonna spend our, our governmental money uh, to clean things up or to not clean things up and, and so forth. So they really have to think about those uh, within context. And then obviously they've got to go out and create graphs and connect graphs and tables. And we have a huge conversations about how you can turn statistics um, into to bad statistics and bad graphs and even something as simple as how people label the x and y axis to make a certain point. Um, we're seeing a lot of this in, in worldly news today as a lot of really, uh, as news agencies are trying to make a point on, on COVID cases and how they're kind of, um, they're not falsifying data, they're just representing it in a way that if you, unless you know or you look closely, you come to some conclusions instead of thinking about uh, what those graphs and tables really represent. Uh, and then I also have them connect um, with non-professionals, environmental professionals, assessments, and how that meets these five major criteria uh, for the, uh, the, the model that I use that I mentioned last time with the CryCheck model. So these are just some examples that you might think about, uh, but you probably can see very clearly that, that this is pretty deep. It's really interconnected. Uh, at first, my students, uh, they really are they're confused uh, about this. They're like, what is this? And they'll say time and time again, uh, so you know, how do I do this research paper? And I have to remind them that this is not a research paper. Uh, the best de definition that I've come up with is it's a pre-research paper. It's what you would do, uh, it's all the data that you would gather if you were gonna sit down and you would want to write um, a research paper or a scholarly paper. You don't just sit down and start writing. You have to gather, you have to data mine, you have to go to the, to the library, you have to gather all these sources from all different places, and then you make some sense of these things. Uh, and that's a really unfamiliar concept uh, to them. So I have to, again, I model that and I share that up front so that they know uh, what it is that, that might be expected of them. Uh, this is the, uh, I have them then do a presentation uh, of their project base, and, and I think I may have mentioned this before, but one of the biggest challenges that I think that we have anytime we do these uh, projects or almost anything in our class is we have students, um, you know, they, they share out or they um, debrief or, or they do some sort of a presentation. Uh, I don't know about you, but I find that, you know, 90% of the time when I used to do this and definitely when I observe classrooms, 
uh, almost exclusively, uh, students will stand up and uh, you know, put up a PowerPoint. Uh, one of them will read the PowerPoint. Somebody will click the PowerPoint. Uh, the others will try to look like they're busy and it's, it's just uncomfortable and non-productive. And so I find, and then the audience, the other students, they're completely disengaged. And it's, uh, I know we're, we're, we're doing this because we want students to have some experience at, at speaking in front of a, uh, an audience and to practice their, their oral skills, which is all great. Uh, but I say that I, it, it hasn't been successful uh, in my classes. And so I, I try to think of a different way to do this. I do have a rubric. Uh, I circled the 1.5 because I wanna encourage people to not, you know, it doesn't have to be even whole points. Sometimes I'll give 1.75 or 1.25 points uh, because you know I just want, I want to be uh, kind of in control of, of assessing and, and evaluating that the way that I think. These are some fairly standard. You see that I, as a chemist, I tend to include a lot of quantitative numbers. So uh, that's how I'm able to determine between one uh, uh, section and the next. But I have them actually create, instead of a PowerPoint or a Google slide, I have them create a Pecha Kucha. And uh, for those, I'll have this link there if you'd like. It's a free site, you can create this, but a Pecha Kucha, is uh, basically uh, a 20 by 20, which means that it's 20 slides, 20 seconds a piece. And that's why it comes out to be about 6.67 minutes. Uh, it's, it's, it's a rolling kind of a loop. Uh, students basically have to create this uh, Pecha Kucha with no text. It only is gonna be graphical representations, so pictures and graphs and tables. Uh, they have to practice it because once they start it, it 20 seconds later, it's gonna go to the next slide, the next slide, the next slide. Um, I find this does some really interesting things. Um, it actually creates an environment where students are more prepared uh, because they have to really make sure that the, the graphics represent what they're going to say. They have to rehearse it multiple times because they don't want to stand up in front of everybody and be behind because once you get behind on a slide, you're going to be behind on all of those. And so they spend a lot more time and energy discussing it, uh, condensing it to be more concise, which is what in my business what we have to do when we speak with clients. Uh, it's, it's a heck of a lot more enjoyable for the audience. They're, walk, they're looking at, at pictures and, and graphics as opposed to text and having somebody read those. Uh, and for the instructor's point of view, it allows me to gauge and manage time to the minute. Because I know once they click that, six and a half minutes later, it's over. Uh, there's no more, oh, they're going long and can you hurry it up? And we didn't have time. So the people who were planning on presenting, present it next class. Nobody likes uh, those situations. So something like a Pecha Kucha is super easy to do, super easy to, 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 to show. Uh, and the, the feedback that I've got from students, and I've done some research on this, they actually at first are confused, and then they are a little bit like, what the hey? And then they love it, because once they realize that they don't have to create and stand up and, and talk like a lecturer, they can actually share a story of all the things with these um, graphics. And they ultimately end up spending a lot more time uh, than they have previously to just get it done. They start to become interested. They start to look at the, the graphics and really try to make things a little more perfect. And so I found that this really aligns well with uh, project-based learning and it allows me to assess um, in a different way um, what they did in, the, in that project. I to make sure I, I have them submit an outline, a script and a storyboard in advance so I can kind of give them some guidance on making sure that they are um, as prepared as possible. The first time you do it, this will be chaotic, uh, but the second and third time, I think you and the students will, will absolutely really appreciate this. All right, great. <clears throat> I've got about 15 minutes left. Um, so I did want to, uh, uh, the final portion of this, I wanted to share, because uh, some people will say, well, I've got a rubric, but I don't know if it's any good, or it really hasn't worked as well as I want it to. And typically that's because one of two parameters. We have to make sure that our rubrics are both reliable and valid. And if you may recall some of your statistics courses or your research methods courses, um, these are two terms that basically are really, really important in almost anything that we do in the social sciences. Reliability is, is simply, uh, is it consistent, right? Is it, is it measuring that same thing over and over and over again in the same way, which, which we all would like that to happen, whether it's our, our tests or our rubrics, uh, anything that we do, we would like to make sure that, that we are consistent at doing this. The, uh, the kind of the, the challenge of reliability is you could actually be highly reliable, but you could reliably measure the wrong thing all the time, <laughs> which isn't probably what you want to do. And that's where validity comes into play, uh, is validity is actually, you know, kind of 
uh, helping you determine whether you are measuring what it is that you are trying to measure and not these other variables, which could be language, it could be um, COVID, it could be uh, nutrition, it could be um, income, it could be all types of things that start to, to enter these things. So you want the rubrics to be both reliable and valid, uh, which is a challenge sometimes, but, but there are some mechanisms uh, that we can, can work with that. How do we do this? Well, there's three major ways. Um, I've kind of put these in, in order of complexity. The first one, which is probably the most common, uh, and I would encourage you to do it. It doesn't really take any um, intensive calculations or statistics. It does take some time, but uh, I'm gonna click on the, the chat. I love the, I wanna double check. Um, there's no questions out there. Good, Padlet. I'd be glad to talk uh, with Padlet with anybody. And again, I've got three other um, Padlet-like um, good. All right. Good. Excellent. Excellent, ex excellent. Um, just want to make sure there was nothing there. It sounds like you're having a great conversation. We're kind of all, it doesn't seem like we're, we're all talking about the same thing, which is uh, part of this uh, online uh, approach. So these three concepts, the calibration, uh, I would encourage you to do this. It's probably the easiest thing to do. Maybe you're already doing this, but the way a calibration takes place is, is you develop the rubric. I would encourage you to have at least one person look at it, uh, maybe a student look at it, and just at least get it by the first draft. And then uh, what you want to do is basically take your get a few folks uh, as many as possible you know probably more than two probably three four five if you can somebody in your department and uh and take an actual artifact take a project take something from either past students or current students and ideally you want to take three of these uh one that's kind of low on the low end the middle end and the high end anytime you calibrate you want at least those three different standards um, and you want to basically share these, uh, you know, make copies and, and, and share these with uh, your, your colleagues and have them independently uh, score those, those, those projects. And so they'll sit down and they'll score those. And, and then afterwards, you'll take those three, four, five colleagues and you'll compare the scores. Chances are the scores aren't exactly the same. And so you'll go through item by item and you'll say, okay, so for the first item uh, and for the first uh, student artifact, you, you know, uh, evaluated this as a, as a one, and somebody else evaluated it as a two, and somebody else as a three. And so you'll talk about not the scores or the student artifact, but you'll talk about the verbiage, you'll talk about your attributes, you'll talk about how you frame those, and you'll discuss how you can modify that so that um, the three of you will agree upon that, those terms, and ultimately end up with a similar score. Doesn't have to be exactly, but for the most part, if you're all you know one point off or one letter off, it's not a big deal. But if you're you know have a large variance, then you'll probably want to modify. And the whole point of this is if the three of you, four or five of you, can agree upon uh, interpreting those words in a similar way, then your students are probably going to do the same thing. Uh, and so you're trying to improve the instrument. Keep in mind that everything here, all of these calculations are being performed on the instrument. The instrument being the rubric not the student. This is sometimes we get confused about this, but you're trying to develop a rigorous, reliable, valid instrument that will measure the same thing cons consistently, uh, whether it's this year, next year, this group of students, and so forth. And so this is kind of on us as teachers to make sure that we're doing our job to have something that actually does its job, which is this instrument. Um, a little more detail is that if you want to create what's called an inner rater reliability coefficient, um, this is a process that you take you, the scores of a student artifacts. Again, it's not about the student. You're not affecting the student. You're affecting you and your instrument and, and your, your rubric. Uh, and you basically uh, do, go through a calculation that I can share with you uh, that determines the percent agreement between each one of these attributes. Uh, and then you basically say, okay, it's got 0.9, 0.8, uh, if it's a high reliability coefficient, then that means that it's actually measuring the same thing um, well. If it's a low one, uh, then you'll want to probably do something about that, right? You'll probably tweak the, what you're writing about it, maybe change the gradations, but you'll want to change that up so that, you, you know, the next time you use it, it has a greater chance. Uh, the last portion of this is validity. 
And there's lots of ways to approach this. The easiest and most straightforward one, which I've already kind of suggested, is to share this with a colleague. And uh, when they look at it and when they provide feedback, uh, that's what's called face validity. And so this is somebody who is um, who knows something about your area, who, um, and I would actually recommend sharing it with, with both, somebody that knows everything about the content and somebody that knows nothing about the content. Um, because keep in mind, that's usually where the students are coming from. Uh, I'm really good at looking at um, and providing feedback on anything but chemistry, because I look at it as this kind of novice person and I'm saying, what does this mean? What does this mean? And I can be a bit annoying uh, to teachers, but I, I really am trying to say what students are probably gonna say. And then you can decide how you can, can restructure some of those terms so that people do understand it uh, and really kind of helps them as opposed to just confuses them. Uh, there's other types, construct, content, criterion, uh, that I'm happy to talk about, but these get a little more in depth at looking deeper into, you know, is it really measuring? Is it representative of your outcomes? Uh, you know, does it, does it correspond to what you're trying to do? And so these are things that really, these are, these are variables that may get in the way uh, from really measuring things accurately. And with any variables, uh, you tend to want to do three main things, right? You want to identify them, minimize them, and then account for them in some way. Uh, and so then this, this turns into almost a um, uh, teaching as research approach at making sure that uh, you're looking at this in a way that uh, you're improving upon that instrument every time. So I know some of this can get complicated. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that sometimes people see rubrics and they think, oh, I'll just borrow one or I'll download one from the internet and it'll be fine. And, and I'm here to tell you it won't be. It, it may cause more problems than, than you, you think. Uh, so you really need to cater it to what it is you're trying to do. You need to do a bit of due diligence to make sure that it is somewhat uh, reliable and valid and then continuously take feedback and improve upon it. And I think if you do that even a couple of years, you'll find that you've got something that really, really is helpful uh, to you and, and to students. Um, I do have, uh, we have about, I don't know, eight or nine minutes left. Uh, I did want to leave you with this and, uh, and, and just as a resource, you can certainly uh, do this on your own time between sessions and I'm happy to review some of these. Uh, but some people at this point say, okay, you know, Hargis, I, I understand what you said, but how do I get started? You know, I've got a blank piece of paper. I've got a blank Google doc. I've got a blank Word document. How do I start? I recommend that you actually start uh, by going out to this free uh, online program. I'm almost positive it doesn't take a VPN. It's called Rubastar. It's, it's created uh, through a US grant. It's been out there for, for years. Uh, and the way it, it works really simply is this is the, the, the cover uh, index homepage of this site. Uh, you'll go to this site and you'll see that it's got little blue buttons down here for oral projects, multimedia, mass, so forth. You'll click on one of those and it'll take you to another subset and you'll basically click on, on a particular rubric that you may want to, um, to look at. And then it allows you uh, kind of full customization. I'll do one really quick here uh, so you can see what that might look like and determine whether you wanna waste your time at exploring it or not. Uh, keep in mind that you can you know, enter all this information and log in and have a site, but I would highly recommend that you don't do that until you really feel like it's something that might be worth your time. So hopefully everyone is looking at a nice uh, pink website. That's how you know you're on Rubistar. And I'll just do an example and I'll click on, since I'm in science, I'll click on science to show you what this really looks like. And I encourage you to do all this. And if you really like this, then I'll show you where you can add some information. Uh, and you can ultimately download this as a Microsoft Excel, and then you can modify it all you'd like. So I'll look at this and I, it gives me some subcategories like building a structure and lab reports. And so I'll click on lab reports. We do a lot of that. Again, I wouldn't um, fill this out, not yet. Uh, if, if you really think you're gonna use it, uh, you can fill it out. But if you scroll down, you start to see kind of what looks like a, a normal rubric. The real magic in this uh, is the drop downs. You notice that when I click the drop down, it's giving me all these choices. And when I click on one, if you can keep your eyes on the boxes, is that it automatically populates those. And this is really quick and powerful. So in a matter of about three seconds, you know, I've got, boom, I've got a rubric, done. Now, is it perfect? Absolutely not, uh, but it's kind of nice because if I didn't like what was in that box, I can replace that. If I didn't like a four and I wanted that to be, you know, an A or I wanted it to be, you know, great, uh, I could change that. So I could play with this all I want until I'm comfortable with it. And then if I really like that, 
um, I had to fill in a little bit of information, just the name and so forth. And, and then I can scroll down and I can submit it. And it allows me to save it as an Excel sheet that then I can play with all I want on my hard drive, on my local drive, uh, and I can work with that. Let me uh, check the chat uh, really quick to see if there are any questions about that. Because again, this, is, this might be worth your time to drafting the first one. I always, you know, some people say, oh, but it doesn't have exactly what I want. Nope, it probably doesn't. Uh, but it will do a really great job at taking you from nothing to something that you can, can work with um, at that point and really help you take kind of the next steps. Uh, so that's called Rubistar, and I'll post that link. If you didn't write it down, I'll post that link in our shared Google Doc uh, so that you've got that uh, available to you. Uh, and I believe, yep, so that is um, in total the, the final amount of this presentation today. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, just stop the recording and